Oh my goodness. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone this evening to Art of Community. My name is Charmaine Arthur, and I am the CEO of Freedom House. Now, before I get into my speaking, let me just say this. I'm recovering from a flu. So my throat still has a little issue. So be very patient with me if I got to pause and, and all of that stuff. All right, let me give you that up front. Before we actually get started, I want to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously supported us in making this event come together. Thank you to the new Commonwealth Racial Equity and Social Justice Fund for your partnership. And our sponsors, Point 32 Health, GE Healthcare, State Street, and Eastern Bank. I would absolutely be remiss if I did not acknowledge our amazing team at Freedom House, our Chief of Development, Fatima Harvey, who is an Hello. energy to compete with and has done an amazing job in pulling this together and the amazing staff at Freedom House. I don't need to go down the line, individual names, but they are on here and they know who they are. We could not have done this without you. Today's event, why are we having this event today? Today's event is a celebration of community, and an invitation to explore how we progress the work of equity and social justice by developing from within community. We've gathered today to explore community through the lens of art. And we hope this is the first of many conversations examining this topic. Why did we choose art? To represent the stories of history, legacy, and our future. Art is joyful rich in tradition of color, powerful. And we wanted a celebration of how we tell our stories. You know, I, I thought about this the other day when Fatima and I was talking, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And there are several pages on Instagram and Facebook that celebrate the culture of our country, our carnival, our food, our music. And all of it is done in such a rich way. And they use art to celebrate the culture and the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And it's powerful. So when we thought about what does imagery do? Why imagery? Why art? It resonates so loudly as I'm talking, right? Particularly when we want to tell a different story, right? It resonates when we shape the narratives of community, our cultural narratives, who resides in our community. So this hour, we brought together some amazing speakers, leaders, and scholars, our artists, um, Nika Jones, who is the co-founder of Art You Hungry, an artist and an advocate, Makiba McQuarrie, Dr. McCrary, followed by a presentation of an incredible project created by Nika Jones. And finally, we will hear from our students, Giselle Yerenya and Terrell Henry. Who's going to moderate this, right? I'm about to slide out real quick and go on mute and enjoy the remainder of this event. I am thrilled to have our fireside chat moderator, Jonathan Allen. Jonathan is the co-founder and director of development at Leadership Brainery, a Boston-based company closing the wealth gap by ensuring underrepresented communities have equitable access to master's and doctoral degrees and workshop leadership. Jonathan was recently named 40 Under 40 by the Boston Business Journal and recognized as one of Boston's most influential men of color. Now my, my accent may come out a bit, I've been talking too long. He is a graduate of Grambling State University, Southern Methodist University and Boston University School of Law. And above 
all that greatness. He's an incredible friend and supporter to Freedom House and a leader in the work to realize our purpose of educational equity for students of color. I release the mic and I hand it over to Jonathan Allen. Thank you. Darmaine, thank you so much for that incredible introduction. And listen, I respect the accent. Y'all can't tell I'm from the South. Um, so I get it all the time. And you sound just like a preacher um, by releasing that mic, that transition was something that I'd do um, if I was behind the pulpit. And so thank you so much for your leadership and the incredible work um, that you and the team at Freedom House is doing um, to uplift our young people and help them excel on their journeys um, academically, career-wise, in community as well. And so round of applause all around everybody, wherever you are for Freedom House and for this incredible convening that they've organized for us to be here together. Um, and indeed, really navigate this conversation around the art of community. And it's amazing um, that, you know, we said the art of community, but we are reflecting on both art um, and community. And uh, this fireside chat will explore the values and needs of strong communities that public institutions, not-for-profits, and philanthropy should prioritize for investment, as well as how to challenge and build new narratives that progress us toward a more equitable Boston. Um, and so I'm really elated um, to introduce our guest panelists, um, Nika Jones, as well as um, Makiba McCreary. Um, and you know, a little bit about um, Nika is that she's a Trinidadian, uh, multidisciplinary activist and artist working in mixed media, embroidery, paint, and more. I mean, her work has been featured in Time Magazine, at the Tampa Museum of Art, uh, Florida Craft Art Gallery, the Furman Center for the Arts, and in Boston, um, intersectional environmentalism and gen generational uproot, um, which is um, the exhibit um, located at the Donald McKay School. Um, Nika uses her artwork to advocate for the protection of women and girls of color um, and graduated May 2020 with a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the University of Tampa um, and has a marketing minor as well. So y'all can check out more of, of, about her work at www.art you hungry.com. So make sure you do that so you can stay plugged in. And then Dr. Um, McKeever McCreary um, serves as president of the New Commonwealth Fund, um, which um, Charmaine briefly um, noted. Um, but this is a coalition founded of Black and Brown executives from Massachusetts leading corporations united to support um, Black and Brown communities amid the COVID-19 pandemic and in wake of the brutal killing of George Floyd. Um, and uh, Makiba joined NCL following her role with the Museum of Fine Arts, um, Boston, um, as the Patty and John Craft Chief of Learning and Community Engagement, where she focused on audience development and integrating diverse perspectives through the lens of art. Um, and it was under her leadership there that she expanded the MFA's annual roster of community celebrations and established the Black Arts and Artists Curator Circle. And before joining um, the MFA, McKeever served as the Managing Director and Senior Advisor of External Affairs for Boston Public Schools, um, reporting directly to the mayor and the superintendent of schools. Now, I can go on. Um, and on about the incredible work of Makiba. So please make sure y'all go look her up, um, connect with both Makiba and Nika on LinkedIn um, and keep up with the incredible work that they're doing. I'm just honored um, that we get to be in this space together to navigate this conversation. So um, Makiba, Nika, welcome. It's so good to have you and to see you today. How y'all feeling? It's so feel good to be here. Thank you, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jonathan. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I'm, I'm just really excited to dive in. And I want to dive in real simple first and foremost. Um, let's unpack and talk a little bit about what your own definitions are for art and community. How do you see art and how do you see community? Um, Nika, let's start with you. Of course. So I think that's an excellent question. And they kind of tie in to each other, art and community. Um, art I see as a universal expression that we can all identify with um, and almost all understand, uh, almost like a, a universal language. 
Whereas with community, I think more of three, three main things that stand out to me. Um, roots, foundation, and efforts. Uh, I think of community more as not just a group of people, which is what a lot of people will think of when they say, oh, there's a community. Um, it's not that there's just a group that exists. It's more of a family of people that have that intention or that effort behind making sure that the entire whole or the entire unit moves forward as one, not leaving anyone behind um, and making sure that all of the attributes and interests are similar and organized as that one unit and one group. So I think that they're both intertwined because with community, of course, art is born. Um, and with arts, that influences and impacts the community as well. So I enjoy that both of them can kind of feed off of each other. And hopefully in this discussion, we'll talk more about how we can do that. That's just, that's so, so incredible. So incredible. Uh, Makiba, I'll let you take a stab at it as well. Sure. I don't think I can um, do much better than uh, Namika just did. But I, I I'll share sort of my definition of community is... Um, the family that you get to choose. Um, and that can be um, a space, a place, it can be um, people, it can be um, work, it can be how you express yourself, which is where the you know, idea for me of what art is comes into play. And I feel like art is, you know, um, it's a conversation. Um, and um, it's up to the, the um, the place where the art is emanating from to make a decision about what they want that conversation to be, but they don't control what that conversation turns into when it's received by um, the viewer or the person who's experiencing that creation, um, if that makes sense. And so I think it's a, a back and forth. I think the possibilities um, uh, that art create are incredible. There's always this question that I've heard so many times, like, is art political? And I just don't think that there's any way to think of art as not being um, political, but that doesn't mean that, you know, political is um, a negative, um, disruptive action. It just means that there's, it offers you moments to reflect. Um, it offers you a vessel to um, perceive conflicts um, and also perceive harmony in two, you know, different ways. Um, so that's what I would share. That's really powerful, um, Makiba, because even the point that you mentioned about um, political, and I think a lot of people become a little turned off, um, a little disjointed anytime we're starting to talk about politics um, um, and, and sometimes limit their framing of what it means to be involved or engaged politically to being a Democrat or being a Republican and having to decide between um, those policy agreements um, and beliefs. Um, but but in fact, you know, this idea that art is an embodiment of a conversation of expression um, that very may so be political in nature. Um, but, you know, you use the word disruption, um, which I think really drills us to this next question that's really important about what the role of art is in upholding and disrupting the stories we tell ourselves. I want to lean into that a little bit about not only the things that we tell other people, um, but the stories that we're telling ourselves and the role that artists playing to uphold and disrupt that. So Makiba, let's stick with you. Let's keep going on, on that sure. thread. I mean, I'll just use an example that I feel like, I hope everybody um, on this webinar has uh, close to them, which is the, the murals that Pro Black has done around the city. Um, and so he is a, an incredible artist. Um, and we worked on a project together when I was at the museum that was um, the image of a, a little girl, a little brown girl who was um, 30 feet tall because that's how tall the building was. And it was at Madison Park um, High School and the facade faces the police department and also faces the street that all of the protests went down, Columbus Ave or Tremont, whatever you wanna call it at that point. Um, and he did it during the summer that um, we were still sort of mid pandemic. Um, but we had just opened up as a city to being able to be outside. Um, so we weren't on lockdown anymore. And um, the answer to your question, Jonathan, is what happens when a little girl walked by that image 
with her grandfather or her mother or her sister or brother. And it happened, all of these things happened. And she looked up and she said, oh my gosh, that is me. Like he did a painting of me. And even you know, Rob's daughter was convinced that that was a, a portrait of, of her. Um, that is that is what art is able to evoke is, is people see themselves in it. Um, they and, and that brings them some level of connection um, that they are not getting somewhere else. Um, and ideally, you know, evokes emotions like joy or like curiosity or even like, you know, could could evoke fear. But it's a very safe experience um, because you're owning that experience yourself. You're deciding what it is that you are pulling from that piece of work. My God, that's so, that's so important. And that's a, a really powerful story um, and example um, of what that representation can do. Um, Nika, you want to respond to that as well? Yes, um, and just feeding off of what Makiba had mentioned regarding the mural, I also have a mural in Boston um, with this oversized little girl. It's at the Donald McKay 8 uh, school, and it's right in front of a playground. But that mural specifically focused on environmentalism and the effect that it was having on future generations. So it's kind of metaphorical and ironic that such a powerful mural in such on a large scale um, was at this playground and so many little kids would come up to me, one and ask to paint with me. Um, so just seeing how art could bring community together in that sense, but it being disruptive in that parents are able to kind of slow down um, and take a closer look at the image, take a closer look at the imagery and the symbolism that's present in the mural the colors and the way that it, it affects your emotions. Um, some people even sit up and cried in front of the mural. Uh, some people will stand up and take pictures with the mural. So it's interesting that it's so, there's a variety of different ways that people can interpret the artwork. Um, there is that hidden message within it where as the artist, I'm almost like a storyteller. And mm -hmm. so I'm able to tell stories of the past, but I'm glad that with art, I have the power to also create new stories or create new narratives. And so bringing those two together, I think there's that aspect of that disruption of making people a little bit uncomfortable because within my artwork, I have a lot of activism rooted in it and I'm not afraid to be real and to be raw, um, whether that's through portraiture, whether that's through the symbols that I use in my artwork, whether that's through the materials that I use in my artwork, because I don't always use paint. And so creating that space where, as an artist, for myself, I'm also making myself a little bit uncomfortable with trying something new, but I know that the impact at the end, um, or the result, or the message, or the story that I'm creating, it's important for other people to pause and kind of slow down and just take in the message and the symbolism within the artwork. So I enjoy that I have that power of that push and pull, making the artwork so enticing that people want to view it and they want to stop, they want to slow down, but also realizing that, hey, this is something more than just a pretty portrait. There's a message behind this, there's a story behind this, and it may not always be something positive. It may be something that's a call to action. That's so, that's so powerful. And I'm listening to both of you and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the beauty. I'm thinking about the mess, right? All of that wrapped into our journeys. And to what extent would you two say that our very existence is art? Is, is, would, would you define it that way? Is, is there a distinction that you would make? Um, is art a final product of something? Is it a creation? Um, can we as people technically be artwork? Like, how do you think about that? I, I'm really intrigued. I think the answer is yes. to so all of those, all of those elements that you mentioned, um, I think we can be because we're creating stories as we live through life. Um, we're in the present moment right now and this moment can be viewed as a piece of artwork or part of a story that we'll tell in the future. Um, it can also be something that's in progress. It doesn't have to be finished. It can still be artwork, even though it's not a complete polished masterpiece. But of course, if you have something that's finished and complete, 
um, where people can view it as a community and on top of that, have conversations about it. That's art as well. So I think the answer is yes to each element because it kind of works almost like a puzzle piece um, interwoven in between different things. I mean, what she said, but what I really want people to know is you, I just went to your Instagram. This is an incredibly talented per person sitting on the screen with me. Everybody should go. You should follow her and you should donate to whatever she's she's raising money to do next because your work is is just gorgeous. I am so honored to, to be able to share space with you. Thank you. Thank you. So amazing. And a matter of fact, Amika's um, commission artwork um, that embodies and celebrates um, Freedom House scholars um, for this event. And they are on sale um, today as a way for you to invest in the work of Freedom House. And so Fatima, if you can drop that in the chat so people don't lose track of the opportunity um, to participate in that way, um, that would be very helpful. And we'll really back again because Nika's gonna come back and, and share some more information um, um, after this fireside chat portion. But I just oh, want to- I'm sorry, I derailed us. I, I got excited, so I derailed us. I'm sorry, <laughs> let's stay on track. No, you didn't. You, you allowed us to put a plug in early. <laughs> 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 um, I really appreciate that. And young people who are on the call, as well as those who are um, committed to uplifting young people um, based even on the, the last few things that we were discussing. I hope that you resonate with this notion um, that you don't have to be perfect, right? That that this is a process, a journey, this thing called life that you're that you're navigating. Um, and you should absolutely embrace it as a, a part of your art piece um, of who, who you are and your own story to tell um, and be inspired by Makiba and, and Nika um, as, as embodiments of what's possible. Um, and so let's talk a little bit, my friends, about um, investment in our communities, the role of philanthropy um, in art and community in equity and social justice. How can those doing the work of social justice challenge the narratives that we see in philanthropy? Um, Keep if you want to um, take us first. Sure, that's a big question. Um, you know, when I came to the New Commonwealth Fund, there were four pillar areas of giving. There was um, health equity, economic empowerment, youth development, and policing and criminal justice reform. And I had just come from the museum and um, I said to my board, you know, I cannot imagine a world in which we're not including art in this, this conversation as a disruptor. And our work is, is to invest in black and brown leaders that are doing um, proximate interventions um, in those areas. Um, and we are statewide, but we are doing it to the end that we believe investing in those leaders will truly disrupt systemic racism. Um, we think that there's a correlation there, there's some causality. And um, folks kind of took a minute to say like, you know what, Mikio, they push back. How how do you think art actually is dismantling systemic racism? And we kept talking about it, talking about it. And finally I said, you know, think of it as identity and culture narrative. It's the way that we get to take power back to tell our own stories instead of the stories that most nonprofit leaders end up having to tell in order to get those dollars, which is that trauma story, that poverty pimping story, that story about how broken we are. And you know, instead, they don't get rewarded with unrestricted dollars by saying our kids are going to go to college, our kids are going to be successful entrepreneurs, our kids are going to be, you know, um, raising a beautiful family and homeowners and all of these things. If we can give them the support that they need to get there, that's the, it's the same, you know, investment that you're talking about. But you have to, as, as the, on the side where you're writing the check, you have to believe that that story of possibility is actually where we're going. That has to be a motivating factor. And right now we are just, we've been so entrenched in this sort of colonialist perspective and approach to um, giving away dollars that says, prove to me how badly you need this. Anyway, the whole point of this story is that we ended up creating a fifth pillar, which we call identity and culture narrative. Um, and that for me is, leaves the door wide open for folks to, um, you know, to tell me how they design their, their identity and how they talk about their culture um, in any medium that they decide is their creative space. 
so powerful. And thank you so much for your leadership um, in that way. I think that's that's innovation, um, right? And in a way of really disrupting and evolving on the way in which we navigate um, the world and, and see um, the value in our communities. And really appreciate what you're doing, um, Makiba, not only at NCF, but what you've been doing. Um, you've been doing this work. Um, so I really think it's important that young people know about you um, and know about the ways in which you've leveraged your experiences to inform how we move our communities forward. Um, Nika, you want to respond to that um, a bit in, in the way that those doing the work of social justice can challenge the narratives and philanthropy? Yeah, so I think when I think of investments, even putting it in my, my own shoes, graduating in 2020, so not too long ago, um, that was also during the pandemic. So it was a time of a lot of uncertainty and chaos and me being an international student and not really knowing which direction to go, where things would go for my art career. Having a BFA or Bachelor of Fine Arts, but it having a pandemic and not being able to show my work, there were just so many different questions. Um, but I think what really pulled me through that time was the investment in and by people who supported my artwork, um, collectors. So that was like around the first time that I started posting a lot more online and realizing, okay, I don't necessarily need to depend on in-person opportunities. Why not take advantage of social media and try to show my non-traditional approaches online? And so that gained a lot of traction. Um, on Instagram, on Facebook, et cetera, and it leading to more opportunities of people seeing my work and wanting to invest. And when I think of investing, I mean, not just giving me money and saying, here you go in exchange for an art piece. There are collectors that were with me from the very beginning who still are with me to this day, whether it's they're just checking in on my work, um, whether it's they wanna pay a studio visit so they'll come in and see the work that I'm doing. Um, they've purchased a collection of pieces so I know how far um, investing can go for creatives um, or young entrepreneurs who have a dream, who have a passion, because it's not just here's some money um, in exchange for this. It's more of that support. And again, coming back to that community uh, where it helps in building that foundation, it helps in building your confidence. And my best projects were probably where I didn't have to worry about uh, machinery or tools, etc. I was just able to create because I had that support of that investment and more so create with intention. And again, not just creating things that were pretty and looked good, but things that had meaning and things that were impactful and things that sparked different conversations. So I think it's important that that question is very, very important, especially in a time like this where there's a lot of uncertainty, there's sometimes a lot of chaos and the youth need that guidance of that support and that investment. That's so important. And, and I, I really appreciate you highlighting the youth um, and particularly um, in closing out um, our conversation um, for the last few minutes. I want us to talk a little bit about hope. And what do you feel is the role of hope um, in perpetuating or furthering our efforts, progressing our efforts around equity and social justice, but also what do you say to young people about how they maintain hope in the face of adversity, how they maintain hope um, when all around them narratives are being told, stories are being told, oftentimes that tell them they can't be, um, that they cannot succeed, that they aren't beautiful enough, smart enough, intelligent enough, don't have the resources, all of these deficit narratives. What do you say to our young people uh, about how they can develop and maintain hope? I think it first starts with gratitude within yourself and that confidence within yourself as well. Um, again, there are those stereotypes of traditional things that have been set in place for us, but as an artist, as a creative, and also just as a person, um, I've noticed that Sometimes it's good to kind of break the rules or push different narratives so that you can dismantle different systems. And that kind of allows you to gain that confidence in 
saying, you know, this is possible for me. Um, and in knowing that many other people are doing it currently, it gives that sense of hope or it gives that sense of, okay, I see this person is actually achieving certain dreams. Um, that means that there is some possible pattern that can be created that I can kind of follow in their footsteps. So they have created this path for me. They have paved this path. Um, and it's my duty now, now that I have that self-confidence, to act on it. So with that sense of hope, I think it's important to remember that there needs to be intention behind it and not just wishful thinking that, okay, well, things will happen for me. Um, and that's kind of why I enjoy being an artist and doing art because I think it pushes that intention even further where in my studio, like physically being in my studio, physically working, physically being outside, making a mural, people are kind of able to see and showing that process as well online, people are able to see that these pieces don't just happen by magic um, or the opportunities that come across don't just happen by magic. I'm actively working towards it. Uh, so that's my view on that aspect of hope um, and kind of reminding the youth that there needs to be that intention and that action behind it. I would say two things um, are important. One is I don't think we actually need to be having conversations with young people um, about how powerful and brilliant they are. I think we need to be having conversations with each other. Those of us who are in positions where we actually have um, an audience and we have um, a bullhorn, um, we need to stop talking about ourselves and our children and our, our children's children as if we're still, you know, struggling to be scientists and doctors and, you know, artists and um, educators. We need to actually talk about how many folks are doing this kind of work and how, how they need our energy and our support to continue to persevere because it is still really hard but it doesn't mean that we aren't there and that we're not doing it. We just need to be acknowledged, we need to be seen. And if we're not seeing each other, then for sure, um, young people are not gonna be able to see that. Um, so I think it's the first thing, because I find young people actually quite um, hopeful in general. And I, I, I even would say um, intolerant of having a future that doesn't have a possibility for them to be whatever they wanna be. Um, and so the, the second thing I would say is, um, you know, um, we need to be turning to, we need to have some courage. We need to have enough courage to turn to folks who are perpetuating these myths about how, um, how um, little possibility we have. And we need to tell them to stop. And we need to help them understand that, you know, it really is about rising tides. It really is about the fact that, you know, if if we are not all doing better together, then there will be another group that is turned upon um, into the future that becomes the, 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 the entity that we all want to be better than, that we all need to be more powerful than. Um, and it's just, it's unnecessary. You know, we um, all, I like to say, you know, there's always the ability to, to bake another pie. So it's not about, you know, the last slice. It's not about who gets the biggest piece. It's about um, being plentiful and um, supportive and um, courageous enough to say, like, you don't lose something because I actually get what I need to be successful, or this young person has opportunities. Um, so the more we can do that. So courage, and I think, um, you know, taking some responsibility. That's so powerful, Makiba, and I really appreciate you um, for drilling in on that. Um, and I'm going to elevate my own conversations um, around, around that notion. So I really do appreciate you pushing us, um, one, to be more courageous um, and, and audacious. Um, and, and certainly, I agree uh, that our young people are on the forefront um, in many ways. And we've seen it throughout history that young people tend to be. Um, right before they start going through all kinds of things and, and, and running into roadblocks that they may have not always experienced. Um, and, but it is that unbridledness um, that has always perpetuated or uh, pushed forward our social movements um, throughout history. Um, so key. Um, so as we close, 
um, if, if you have anything to say to the Freedom House community overall about the importance of the work that Freedom House does, um, what would you say? I, I'm all about leadership um, and I think organizations, they don't exist, you know, within a, a vacuum. Um, Charmaine's leadership is tremendous. It has been since the day that I first met her, which we won't say how many decades ago that was, um, but she was leading then fiercely protecting children, promoting children, um, and um, she continues to do that now. So I have no doubt that her team is right there next to her. Um, and it's a staple of our community. You know, it's it's an organization that is ours. Um, and so as much as she and her team are protecting all of us and our, our children and our families, we need to be able to do the same for, for her and for them. Thank you. And yeah, I second that as well, I think finding out about Freedom House and everything that they stand for, um, and then meeting the team behind the organization um, and learning about the legacy, learning about the different faces that I was able to use for my artwork. It just, it allowed me to gain a greater appreciation for one youth, um, but multiple generations and how they set up future generations for success. So I think initiatives like this are so important. Even conversations like this are extremely important in grounding us um, and having us kind of look back at things that happened in the past, uh, things that happened throughout history and how that has paved the way for where we are now and future events and future opportunities that we're able to create for us. So powerful, everybody. Um, let's give it up for Dr. Makiba um, McCreary and Nika Jones, thank you so much um, for your leadership, for being here, for showing up in this way today. Um, and again, everybody make sure that you do indeed um, go and follow them on LinkedIn, plug in, keep up with the work that they're doing at the New Commonwealth Fund, as well um, as Aren't You Hungry um, through Nika. And so Nika, let's let's move over um, deeper into your work. Thank you again, um, Makiba. Um, and uh, um, Nika is about to give us a reflection on the Tiles of Tradition um, project that she's worked on. And again, if you have not clicked the link, um, that Fatima put into the chat so you can check out this incredible artwork and begin bidding on it um, as a way to invest um, in the work of Freedom House. Y'all take this moment to do it right now. Um, go take a look at that link um, and keep up uh, with this incredible artwork. So Nika, give us, give us a reflection, an overview of the work that, um, that you've taken the time out to do um, for this momentum occasion. Of course. So like I had kind of mentioned before, I work in multiple media. So I do paintings, I do murals, illustrations, hand embroidery, mixed media artwork. So when I was first contacted by Freedom House for this project, um, I know Fatima and I were going back and forth about the idea of what we would do, um, but making sure that we, we stood firm on the theme of Freedom House and what it stands for and different things throughout Freedom House that would bring it to where it is today. Um, and when I first did the initial art ideation session, I remember doing more of an abstract idea or more of a general idea of just a portrait that I would put together based on my process of creating my artwork. And I remember being on the Zoom and everyone kind of stayed quiet for a little bit, but they stood firm in allowing me to explain my idea behind the piece but at the end kind of explaining you know what Anika this is something that is personal to Freedom House this is something that we truly want to speak the voice of Freedom House and so we would actually prefer if you used the faces and symbols um, and different moments that we have captured to make this artwork something that truly represents Freedom House so these 25 tiles are literally the faces of Freedom House um, and kind of pulling that together in an image that's empowering, in an image that highlights legacy, multi-generational um, aspects of Freedom House, and kind of reflecting on one past events that have happened that, again, have paved that road for education, for success, 
um, and created that legacy that will live on forever for Freedom House. So I was happy to find that happy medium with everyone on that call who actually gave their support for the artwork, um, but seeing it actually come to its final stage, all of the vibrant colors, all of the imagery within it, I think it really speaks to the voice and the legacy of Freedom House. So I'm honored that I was the artist that was able to create this piece. So amazing, just so incredible. And I'm so inspired by you as a leader, as an artist. Um, and again, folks, if you have not already clicked on the link to view um, this artwork and see the pieces separately um, as well, um, you can via the link. Um, and it, it's really incredible. And I'm really excited um, about the next part of this, this occasion, this event, um, which you know, some of the artwork that you will see um, presented, we're actually getting ready to hear from um, one of two of the students um, who are alum of Freedom House, who are doing incredible work in their own right. Um, and uh, um, I am uh, I'm really excited to introduce and bring forward Giselle Urena, who is a Freedom House alum, my friend, my girl, um, and a graduate of Snowden International High School and Brandeis University, and is currently a Tech Start Technology Associate at Liberty Mutual Insurance. Um, welcome, Giselle. Um, and then we also have Tyrell Henry, um, who is um, a graduate of Jeremiah E. Burke, um, Burke High School and is currently a student at Northeastern University majoring in mechanical engineering. Welcome, Tyrell. Um, both of you are incredible, killing the game. So proud of you. Um, and please um, take a moment, um, both of you, um, to introduce yourselves and kind of share your own reflection about your experience uh, with Freedom House. And, uh, and Giselle, let's start with you. Yes. Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> I have not seen the mural or the, the artwork. And to see my face there, my heart is coming out of my chest. <laughs> I am so thankful for absolutely every person that's in this call and that's making this happen. Um, a little bit about me, I'm Giselle Ureña, originally born and raised in the Dominican Republic and came to the United States in 2009. Um, before I was asked to come and, and give a little bit of my input, I was asked the question, why is investing in community so important? And I was told I have three minutes. And I said, you know what? You can give me 30 seconds to answer that question. Because if you, have you ever, um, excuse me, getting a phone call. Have you ever heard the saying um, that it takes a village to raise a child? That's exactly what I thought immediately. That's the answer. It takes a village to raise a child. And so when I think about people and I think about myself, that I considered myself someone so independent, so self-sufficient, and I realized like, wait a minute, it has taken so many people for me to get this far in life. And all of those people have invested in me and all those people have been invested on. And so I don't care who's in this call, you have, you've needed someone to extend that hand so that you can get to that next step, next phase, next season of your life. And so I wanna like dive a little bit deeper onto why it's also so important to invest in communities. And that is because not everyone has the privilege to have a mommy and a daddy, right? Uh, an environment in their home that's safe, that they get poured into, or that they can focus on being a child, right? That they don't have to rush to be an adult or have to rush to be their own parent or have to rush to be their parents' parent. And so that was me, that was me. And based on the community that I've been able to walk into and, and the communities that I've been able to um, get supported by, I've been able to get this far in life because my options, what I saw, it was that I either needed to be, get married at a young age or have children, become a housewife or objectify my beauty, my appearance, my body so that I wouldn't have to be in this survival mode, right? 
because that's what my mother have to do, had to do. My mother got pregnant at the age of 14 years old. And when she got abused, instead of her parents being there for her, she was seen as a disgrace and kicked out at that young age. I practice, I promise. <laughs> and, um, and so that, that's what I saw. That's what I thought were my options. And so now I want you to understand why it's so important to invest in communities. Because investing in these communities, in these villages, it gives people the opportunity, people like me, to see other stories, to see other narratives, to see other perspectives, right? And that's why today I am a software engineer. I am a first generation high school student, first generation college student. I am a leader. I am a mentor because I got to see all those things in somebody else in other communities and I saw it possible for me and so now I ask you do you think it takes a village to raise a child because like my my fellow sisters and queens here said the panelists it's a way to disrupt the narrative is a way to break these generational curses it's a way for us to build from what we know we're meant to be doing, right? We, we, for us to build from the foundations of our purpose that's already instilled in us. Like my sister said, we don't have to be told like we, we're not engineers or doctors or we know we are, we're doing it already. We just have to be seen. We just have to make sure that we get to make this normal and break these system, systematic oppre oppressive um, systems, excuse me. And so that that's my answer to, to this question. It's a way for me to use my story to get invested, to invest in those that also see themselves in me. And this is not only for me, right? Freedom House is a community that is changing thousands of lives. This is one story of thousands of students that have walked through those doors and have seen Freedom House as their freedom home, like I usually say. And so I hope that this was clear as to why it's so important to invest in communities because you see someone right now on this screen, you see someone that could have had a different story and not make it this far in life. And so I thank you, Jonathan, for being, for your energy. And I thank everyone else for making this happen once again. I pass it on to my brother here, Tyrell. Thank you, thank you. I just wanna say thank you guys for having me in this like wonderful space. It's so like inspiring and I'm, I'm uplifting, you know, seeing everyone in their own lanes and um, doing their thing. It's like inspiring for me to go on and do those things. But um, yeah, I'll go back to Rome. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, raised in Trinidad. Um, then I came to um, Boston where like, it was like kind of finding my lane and seeing where I could fit in. And I think it's where um, Giselle was kind of like pointing on, like when you find that like support group, it's like, it's like so important because like sometimes you could kind of fall off and you can switch lanes so fast and become like a whole different person. But like that little support kind of pushes you into like, like so much because a little support could get you so far in life. And I feel like if I didn't have like those family members around and Freedom House, I feel like I wouldn't be introduced to the people who, I, who I've met that are pushing me on to um where I want to go and where I see myself in the future. So um yeah, definitely community is important and um it's great being here. Thank you so much, Terrell, and wishing you well as you continue your studies, continue to crush it, continue to get out there, make impact um, in our communities. We're rooting for you, um, as well as you, Giselle. Y'all are amazing um, and amazing byproducts, examples of the power of Freedom House and obviously the power of community. Um, and it, it's an honor um, to get a chance to witness um, your journeys um, in this world. Um, and, uh, you know, Without further ado, 
um, I am really excited now to introduce as we close out this event, a round of applause for everyone who's participated in the program um, to date. Um, and again, I just went and took a look at the link um, and I see we have um, one bid um, and we need more bids. Um, so please, if you have not already um, bid on any of the artwork, um, get in where you fit in. Um, and spread the word uh, so that we can continue to support Freedom House. And, and so now as we get ready to close out, um, I wanna thank you again for inviting me to moderate um, this, this occasion and encourage you, um, you know, and around the work that even Charmaine opened up and te telling you what, that we do at Leadership Brainery, which is increasing access to master's and doctoral degrees for underrepresented communities. I got up to Boston in 2016. It was one out of four black men out of 250 students that entered into my law school class um, and started looking around saying, wait, this is a problem. Um, and what's the connection that this has to management and senior leadership in the workforce. Um, and so if you know of young people um, who are in college um, and who are interested in going to graduate school, tell them about Leadership Brainery. And I say that even um, with the fact that we have several students that have come through our program um, who are Freedom House alum, whose parents are Freedom House alum and have um, um, put their children on to these opportunities. Um, we are um, the, the, the next step um, in support um, and, and encouragement and resources. And so we wanna connect the dots here. Um, and so it's my honor to be in community with you all um, and doing this work alongside you. Um, and so without further ado, I wanna um, bring forth the chair of the board of directors, uh, Dr. Andrew um, Sobers, who will take us out. Okay, thank you. So to start with a little tidbit. So it goes like the sound of the sea the curve of a horizon, a wind in the leaves, a cry of a bird leaves the manifold impression in us. And suddenly, without our wishing it at all, one of these memories spills from us and finds expression in musical language. I want to say my interior landscape with the simple artlessness of a child. And that's by Claude de Bozzi, who talks about expressing yourself in life and in art. So like, Dunton said, my name is Andrew Sobers, and I'm proud to be the chair of the Board of Freedom House. And whenever I hear students and alumni like Giselle and Terrell talk and talk about their journey, and whenever you hear from them, it tells us of the impact of the Freedom House programming and support services, and it shows true to be evident. We are grateful to all of you who joined today and making this a success. And I invite you to support this work by participating in the artwork audition, which will remain open to Friday. So that's important. It will continue to be open. So please support um, by those expensive pieces and support our artists. So I also want to thank um, our panelists, Nakia Jones and um, Dr. Makiba Makiri, and of, of course, our high energy host, Jonathan Allen. Could we give Jonathan a round of applause? Everyone would agree that he was amazing. So thank you for your high energy, Jonathan. And as John Dewey stated, art is not the possession of the few who are recognized writers, painters, musicians. It is the authentic expression of any and all individuality. Those who have the gift of creative expression in unusually large measure disclose the meaning of the individuality of others to those others. In participating in the work of art, they become artists in their activity. They learn to know and honor individuality in whatever forms it appears. The fountains of creative activity are discovered and released. The free individuality, which is the source of art, is also the final source of creative development in time. So for me, this uh, presentation was really, really timely. It touched on matters of community and art and bridge those gaps and talk about the one thing that we continue to fight against and try to work on is the social class, but also the, the equity and disparity amongst um, black and brown people. And I think Dr. Makiba um, articulated the fact that we're not looking for handouts, but we are looking to go from good to great, right? So oftentimes we have to tell that sad story to get money as opposed to 
imagine if you had ten dollars to invest would you not want to invest in a club that's doing well or a company that's doing well why do we have to often say that we are not doing well to get help it's almost like to keep us to a substandard process as opposed to look we are doing such great things but we need you to get further and i think sometimes if we would consider that we would see how much further we will be able to go I also want to, at this time, ex extend my appreciation to our event partner, New Commonwealth Fund, and our amazing sponsors, Point32 Health, GE Healthcare, and State Street, and Eastern Bank. Be sure to follow Freedom House on your preferred social media platforms to stay connected to the news, future opportunities, and events. So thank you all, and have a great, great evening. And with that, I close. I don't know if um, Charmaine want to have any closing remarks or are we free to let everyone go at this point? We are free to let everyone go. Okay, thank you all and have a great evening.